Heavenly Father, we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Father, we thank you that you are having your way among this people this week. That we are not going to leave here the same. And the spiritual atmosphere is not going to be the same when we're done this week. And so, Lord, we give you the honor and the glory in advance for that in Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Abba Father, we come before you tonight, your people, called by your name. We humble ourselves and we come together through the blood of Jesus Christ in one accord, in unity, one heart, one mind. United in thought and in purpose. Our thought and our purpose is nothing less than revival and awakening that leads to reformation in this nation. We decree and prophesy America shall be saved. Amen. But the Lord would say, this is a beginning. Oh no, this is a new beginning, says the Lord. And the Lord says, I have gathered my remnant watchmen, my remnant intercessors. And the Lord says, I've always used a remnant. I've always begun with a remnant. And the Lord says, I have remnant reformers. I have remnant intercessors, remnant watchmen. And the Lord would say, I am putting you on the wall strategically. And the Lord says, get ready, because there is literally going to be an explosion of the power of God upon my remnant. And the remnant is going to become infectious. And that, inf that infectious anointing is going to begin to multiply and multiply and multiply. And the Lord says, I can put a nation on our knees. I can put a nation on our knees. And the Lord says, there was something that happened even today that you do not understand what occurred when the AT&T system went down, says the Lord. But the Lord says, know this, that is, is that is a foretaste of the shakings that are to come. But the Lord says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and begin to take authority in the heavens, seated, come up higher, says the Lord, come up higher to the throne room. And the Lord says, there are many, many more attacks being planned. But the Lord would say, even I'm giving you authority to begin to stop what is coming on a certain level, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Now listen. In 1999, we gathered a group of prophets in this city. And the, at that time, there was something coming called Y2K at the turn of the year 2000. They thought all the computers were going to go down. But what happened was, in that group of remnant of prophets, we interceded. We fell on our face and we wept. And who knows what those prayers did? We don't know. But the Lord gave us a word at that time. And the Lord said to us, what is coming is far worse. And the Lord showed us. And many had dreams about disaster striking our East Coast. Many had had dreams about the in the room. And so we began to weep and the Lord gave us another word and he said, you can, you can uh, uh, stop it from being as big as it could be, but you cannot completely stop it. And then we wept again. I mean, we just fell on our faces weeping and weeping and weeping. But the Lord is giving a prophetic warning in the time of shaking, but the Lord would say, will you trust me? Do not get into fear. But the Lord says, I have brought together a remnant 
to make history, a remnant that can even begin to stop what has happened in our schools, stop what has happened with our children, stop what has happened. The Lord says, yes, the mama bears are going to arise. The mama bears that realize you have pushed us too far. The mama bears that will draw a line in the sand and say, you can't cross that line. So Father, I thank you tonight as we inaugurate this time together. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that we know at any moment in America, there could be terrorist attacks. At any moment, there could be EMPs. At any moment, something could happen. But Father, tonight we throw ourselves on your mercy and we cry out, mercy, Lord! Mercy, Lord! And Father, we cry out in judgment, remember mercy. And the Lord says, don't think it's surprising that judgment has come to the house of God first. And the Lord says, I haven't finished. I'm getting ready to rip the covers off some more things that thought they were very hidden and very secret. But the Lord says, my eyes see everything. But the Lord says, don't let these things shake you for the enemy wants to stop the prayer movement. The enemy wants to stop the anointing that can come and cause confusion. But the Lord says, no, out of this place tonight, there is a remnant movement coming that's going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And the Lord says, watch and see what I will do because out of the remnant comes revival and out of the revival comes reformation and it will be enough to save a nation says the Lord.
want you to uh, hear this story. When God put it on our hearts that a million women and their Mordecais would go to Washington, D.C. at a last stand for America. I remember saying, Lord, what day? Maybe I'll get up on this because it's... <laughs> and I, I, I said to the Lord, Lord, I, I was just musing. And I said, Lord, what day is the day of atonement? And I said, Lord, let it be on a Saturday so we could gather. And I looked it up. It was 10, 12, October 12th, 2024, the day of atonement. And at that point I knew If Parks and Recreation DC don't give us a permit, I'm still gonna do it on that day. Because it is the day that a nation, the iniquity of a nation can be removed. And there is coming a cleansing and a preparation for that day. But my friend of 40 years, dreamed a dream that confirmed to me the centerpiece of this gathering of all gather all that we do is the exaltation of the blood of Jesus and he had a dream and in this dream he saw these three tables and in that each of those tables a song music was coming out the first song was a song called warrior but it was a good song and it exploded horizontally all across the nation. And then another song by Joan Baez, some of us older folks might remember, called the Dream Song. And it's an incredible poem of justice and hope. And that song exploded horizontally across the nation. And it was a good song. But then the third box, a song was being sung and it was this song he, in his dream. And when she began to sing that song, thank you for the, G, for the, for, for the blood applied. It's not enough that he has shed his blood, it must be applied. Prepared for and applied. And he said in the dream, that song went vertical. It exploded into the heavens. And on that day, all the other horizontal songs were swept into the vertical song. And I knew that this was the anthem of a million women and their families exalting and pleading the blood of Christ over America. And I began to ponder what if on that day, we would sing this song for two hours? Listen, why do something new if God is saying, this is the song that's gonna break something in the heavens over the whole nation. Can you today lift your hands as we sing this again? And I want you to sing it with a million women and millions around the world. This is a global day of the exaltation of the blood. Let's sing it together.
the center of the throne. There is a lamb at the center of the throne. Come on, let's just break out and sing this again. Can you see it? The blood applies. Lord, we cry out to you that you would apply your blood to our confusion, our death, to our pain, to our rebellion. Lord, release the blood. Release the great communion revival. Lord, lift your voices and pray with me. We cry out. cello play because it's not just for America it's for every individual who has an instrument in their hearts I want just to have the cello and would you receive the blood of Christ tonight covering you so you can stand tonight without shame in the presence of God
lift your voice just begin to sing in the spirit just one another. Thank you, Nina and team, for leading us. Hey, Jay. I don't know if you, check, 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 check. I don't know if you can pull it up, whoever's doing this stuff. Could we, if you can, let's go, let's turn to Isaiah 22.
The theme of this conference, maybe I shouldn't call it a conference, an engagement with heaven, with a divine purpose. Isaiah 22, 22 has been a historic scripture for me personally. Sunday night, Dutch Sheets will be speaking here. Stick around. Um, forever, he's had this number just exploding, two, 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 two. I claim that I got there before he did. <laughs> I write about it in my book, Digging the Wells of Revival, of this whole two, two, two story, which two, two, two is the keys of David and the shouldering of the keys of David, the removal of Shebna, who was a steward, and the raising up of Eliakim, the son of inheritance. I named this authority over the nation. And in many ways, the reason that I have brought, and we and my team have brought in Cindy and Dutch and Jonathan Kahn, because I don't know three others who are carrying this dimension of spiritual authority. And in fact, Dutch and Cindy lived here in, and Mike, Colorado Springs, which I believe in many ways is the strategic spiritual warfare center of America. Now, Jonathan Kahn might think it's New York. <laughs> and it, maybe it's the devil's strategic. <laughs> But we have had this sense that, that this is a gathering that's pointing to authority over the nation. And this is but a beginning of an eight month march to that gathering on the mall that I believe we could actually gain spiritual authority. I wasn't gonna say this, but the Lord just brought it back to my mind. I had a dream during the January 6th time and this is not boasting because I'll tell you what, I had a dream that it was the president of the United States. Yeah, ow, that's a disaster. <laughs> Seriously, obviously it's symbolic. I believe the church is being given an opportunity to gain spiritual authority over these next months to go to the day of atonement, not just for a great day and a great event. You don't go to the day of atonement without preparation and repentance. And I believe part of what we're doing this week is to actually take you on a journey, a prophetic prayer journey, a, a prophetic storyline that we've dreamed about even recently that points us to this remarkable, uh, this remarkable storyline but you may not like what we have to go through for cleansing to get to the place where we actually get authority. In the dream, there was a massive gathering on the mall in DC. I didn't see, I couldn't see where they were. I just knew there was like a million people gathered together. I didn't know what to say. My administration was in chaos but I had to speak to this gathering as the president. And in the dream, I said to my assistant, I don't know what to say. No one does in a sense in America right now. Jesus does and he's giving his prophets eyes, eyes to see, but it is chaos and confusion. But in the dream, I said to my assistant, I don't know what to say. He said, well, you gotta talk anyway. I didn't talk. Sometimes we need to not talk. And in the dream, I lifted my hands and the whole crowd started chanting, revival, revival. Could we be coming to a moment of time that could shift elections by gaining into the house of a th the courts of the Lord with rulership through cleansing and through the blood that actually could bring revival and reformation? You say, Lou, how do you know? I don't know. I just refuse to disbelieve the prophetic. I refuse to abandon no matter what people are saying. 
to abandon the prophetic storyline, you've got to follow it the whole way. And I look back at my journey, and I, you know, these are great days to be vulnerable. But I was telling my friends just this week that in 1997, I had a dream. I wasn't doing pornography, but I was struggling at that time. And I had a dream, and in the dream, I'm with major leaders from across America, and Cheon, Apostle Cheon, my pastor, along with our pastors here, asked me, said, Lou, would you pray for Bill Clinton? He's sleeping in bed. And in the dream, I run to pray for him and I'm only in my underwear. <laughs> don't, don't laugh. It's a bad dream. <laughs> I, pay, I pray this pitiful dream, a pr pitiful prayer, and I run to get covered. I wake up and the Lord says, neither you nor the Church of America has authority to waken Bill Clinton because it sleeps in the same bed. We're going here this week. God is coming to cleanse the priesthood. He's coming to deal with his bond servants who have been seduced by the spirit of Jezebel in this land. We cannot turn this nation. You cannot bind what binds you. We have to get to a place. And maybe it's, as Cindy said, a remnant. But maybe it's a remnant of a million women and their families. I tell that, I tell that, you know, you just risk being vulnerable, but I think the Lord was actually pointing to me early on in the 90s, this is where it's headed. This is where it's headed. We have got to win the high places of government, education, and we've got to win the high place of revival and awakening in America. And I feel that this weekend is actually just a beginning, an opening of the door of a process that leads to the day of atonement. This is why I'm so thrilled tonight to have Jonathan Kahn with us. I have read three of his books over the last year devouring them and he'll introduce called the paradigm the return of the gods and the josiah mandate and i don't know any man in america right now that that seems to have the template of god's mind and thoughts concerning america right now like jonathan is actually carrying i met with him last year on the day of atonement and he, a rabbi, with revelation concerning this nation, will be helping lead communion on that day. And applying the blood. Last night, Falaki, just come up here real quickly because I'm going to get Jonathan right up here. People started having dreams last night. And they were waking up at 2 2 2. That's not strange to me because I, I know we're in a prophetic moment. We're having to hear what God is saying right now. And Falaki is a Nigerian scary lady. <laughs> and I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know her, but I would like you to tell the dream that you had on February 2nd last year, and then what you dreamed this morning. Okay. Now, if, before we go on, you say, well, what about dream folks? 222 has historically been a, a, com a, 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 like a community of sons and daughters that gather together. Our, our world is dreams and revelation. I hope you don't get offended with it. The scriptures are the foundation, and we need to read them more and more and more. But also, God has given prophets, the sons of Issachar, that know the times and what Israel should do. And he gives a specific revelation on how to pray. And I believe that this is, uh, you're going to hear a lot of this tomorrow. You don't want to miss anything. Tomorrow afternoon is going to be incredible. In, in the morning, we're going to lay out that women's vision. with Chris Smith, Mark Gonzalez, scary guy. 
is going to blow their socks off and just don't get offended. It's going to be a powerful time. That tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, we're going to deal with the issue of exposure of sin in the church. So you don't want to come. You do want to come because you want to be a part of a historic, what we believe is a historic narrative of 24 years of this journey to see America turn back to God. Falaki, tell those, uh, tell those stories, and then I'm, I'm gonna bring up Jonathan. So I'm gonna tell this story quickly, but before we do that, can we just give an applause for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? He's in the house, he's in the house. The Lord is in the house. Can we give him a standing ovation? The Lord is in the house. in this room today and we give you the honor the glory and the praise we love you Jesus in Jesus name everybody says I'm just going to rush this because I'm ready to hear from Rabbi Jonathan Khan. So in 2022, February 2, 22, I have a dream. 222. Two, two, two. Two, two, two. Yes. <laughs> so it's 2222. Two, two, two. But before then I had dreamt of this general. I had never met him. In the dream, I had a, a dream previously where Abraham Lincoln came to me in a dream and said, I, I dealt and stopped the slavery of my days. Would you join me in stopping the modern day slavery with men like this? And that was the first time I met Lou Ingle in my dream. Never heard of him, never heard his name. My friend has a sister in Kansas City. And she was like, yeah, there's a guy called Lou Ingle. He's actually a real person. And so on February last year, I mean 2022, I have a dream. I have never been to Washington, D.C. In the dream, I am in Washington, D.C. And as I was walking, I see the same man I've seen in my dream. This is the fourth time he has a life tape on his mouth. And as I'm walking towards him, the Lord said, and I'm going to say this because in the kingdom of God is honor. The Lord said, this is one of my generals and I love him very much. Hallelujah for the sacrifice that he has paid with his family for us to be here. And when I got next to him, I said to him, Lou Ingle, the Lord has called me to tell you, thank you for what you've been doing for standing for life. But right now, the strategy has changed. We are no longer doing the life tape because we're in the decade of the pay. I have never heard the word pay in my life. And in the dream, I said, we're in the decade of the pay. So the Lord asked me to take the tape off of his mouth. Then suddenly a table shows up, a new red tape. And the Lord says, right on the tape, it is finished. <laughs> It is finished. And as I was going back to put it on his mouth, the Lord said, no, it's a decade of the pay. Put it on his forehead. And then when we both look to the north, to the south, to the east, men, women, old, black, white, green, whatever color, they were coming. And we said together, Roe v. Wade is finished. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, that's our God, that's our Jesus. And I want to honor not only him, his family, and these men that are here, 18 years, they stood, and we get to come alongside right now. I just want to give honor where it's due. So much of the time, you know, I get credit for these things. There's a man here that led a movement for 18 years standing in front of the Supreme Court with tape on their mouths five days a week, dreamed dreams of who the judges would be that would overthrow, and they prayed those judges into me. I want Matt Lockett to stand and give thanks for, for an amazing story.
storyline of intercession. And many of us were on that wall in DC. Let's now give thanks to God. And then quickly to Josiah. So this morning, I woke up at 222, and the Lord said to me that you are in the time of Josiah. Now, Josiah is in the book of 2 Kings 22. And if you start from 2, the Bible says Josiah was 8 years old. From now till we go to Washington State, I mean Washington, D.C., is 8 months from today. And the Lord said to me, remember the dream I gave you about Josiah. In 2022, I had a dream about Josiah. I was taken to the ancient days, and the Lord said to me, you're going to meet a king. And I'm met this man and he said my name is Josiah and he said what are you I said my name is Folake he gave me a word he said there's going to be one last day's movement and that movement is for today are you ready it's going to be Jew and Gentile it's going to be the most miraculous but it's not going to only be a revival we've done the revival are you ready for the second part? It's going to be revival and reformation. America will be saved. What, what's really crazy is that though uh, we many spiritual daughters for years have been working in this vision of a million women, but Falaki was the first one that I connected with. Her ministry is named It Is Finished. Little did I know that she didn't know that a gal named Jenny Donnelly in Portland would be the woman that I would connect with, with this million women on the mall. And guess what the name of her movement is? Tetelestai, which means it is finished. It's the blood. It's the blood that is going to be carried. I want to encourage you. Jonathan Kahn's written a book called The Josiah Mandate. It's blown my mind. What's the chances she dreams this last night? The return of the gods is really bad news. <laughs> but you've got to read it because your eyes are open to seeing what is going on of the demonic possession of this nation. But he, but I don't know if I told you this, John, the epilogue was the best part of the book. Now, the whole Ishtar story, man, rocked my world. And I look forward to hearing more and more from Jonathan. But the epilogue was this. Because it was, America is, is being repossessed. Seven times worse because she was once cleansed. And now she's got rid of God. And seven times worse have come in. But here's the deal. He said... In the epilogue, I never write epilogues. I wasn't planning on doing an epilogue, but something happened on the day I finished the manuscript. And my friends or my people said, you need to write an epilogue. For on the day I finished my manuscript, Roe v. Wade was overturned. <laughs> and it was a sign not to just rejoice, but if the church would see it as a sign and press forward. Keep pressing forward. It could be a sign that a nation can actually remove the demonic covering and loose us in a new day of awakening like a Josiah mandate. Will you welcome a man that I consider a friend, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn? <laughs> Brother, I love you. What this say? Thank you. Well, shalom. shalom. It is great to be with you and to see the worship, the heartfelt worship. The spirit is here. You are a people who are so sincere and passionate for the Lord and for revival. And that's a blessing for me to be here. I, I want to say, um, first of all, it is, uh, I want to say also to thank you to, to uh, Todd and, and Kelly, uh, who we met in Israel. They said, come to our thing. Well, we're, I'm here now. <laughs> so, 
Um, and and Lou uh, and great friends of great people who I keep going, we keep crossing paths, Cindy and, and the rest. I, I, um, but Lou is such a powerful man of God. And I, I believe that God wanted Lou, oh, I gotta say something you know, before that, you know, I believe, I think when you said this, it just hit me, I think I was woken up at 2.2.2 two, two, two this morning. And then I got back to sleep and I think I, I was there for 2.2.2 two, two, two again and woke up at 4.44. I don't know what that means, and then that was it. So I'm wiped out, thanks a lot, Lou. But it is great to be here with Lou. I believe God wanted us to be together for a long time. Um, and, you know, we were together on Yom Kippur and it was just the spirit of God that came. And Lou did not remember the first time we met. I was in Washington, D.C. before I wrote any book, before I wrote The Harbinger. And I was on a prophetic journey in Washington. And I was led to walk over to the Supreme Court. And there I saw people with tapes on their mouths and Lou in front of them. And they were protesting the killing of babies and praying. And, and there was an immediate connection. And he asked me to pray, and I prayed the ironic blessing. That's when we first met, but I kind of always knew, I always remembered, and I, I felt we were going to meet again. And now, now I, I want to tell you, I have a lot to share with you tonight. Uh, I've never get this. You know, when I speak somewhere, I always want to make sure I'm, you know, I'm not going to exceed the time that they want. You know, I told that to Lou. He said, no, 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 take more time. So I've never been told, pressured to do more than less. <laughs> So now, so now, no matter how much I share, let me just uh, tell you a few things. I can only give you a taste, of course. There's so much more. So as soon as I finish, I'm going to go wherever they have the books. And the, my ministry is to get the word out. And by speaking, but also by writing, um, I was so blessed when Lou said they were studying the books. So they're going to have a number of them. So let me quickly tell you what they'll have, and then we'll move into it. Uh, number one is, I think you heard of it, it's The Harbinger. That is the ancient mystery that holds the future of America, um, and it has continued to come true since it came out. And it has, not, it has not stopped, and there are millions who have read it, but there are millions who have not, so if there's people in your life, I'm, I'm praying you don't just get these things for yourself, but for people who need to hear. Second is the book of mysteries. This is hundreds of the mysteries of God, um, and it is to be blown, God just blows us away. But also, people are giving it to unsaved people, and they're getting saved. Third, nobody's ever turned it down. Third is the Oracle. That's the, the, the book I wrote about end times and the countdown and the timetable that we have, Israel, Jerusalem, um, and, and the mind-blowing mysteries of where we're going. Fourth is the Harbinger too. I held back for years on writing it until God said, this is the year you have to write it. There's going to be shaking. And when I started writing it, it was 2020, the beginning, and then all the shakings came on America. This is where we are. This is where we're going. Uh, the next one is what I just, what Lou just mentioned. It's the return of the gods. I'm, I'm surprised they did not ban this one. But this is the gods, the spirits that have returned, that are behind everything. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. The dark trinity um, of that. I'll give you a little taste. It'll be in what I share. And the last as Lou said, is the Josiah Manifesto. That's subtitled The Ancient Mystery and Guide for the End Times. And that is what if God was giving us a calendar of what is happening being fulfilled from the ancient times and a guide, a manifesto a, from the Bible, what we need to know now and to go forward in the end times. This is, as Lou said, it was the day I finished the return of the gods that God started the Josiah Manifesto. He said, now you got to give an answer. You got to give an answer. That's how it happened. So now I call you to get the word out. This is to encourage you to get it for yourself and your family as well, people in your life. Um, so this is what they're going to do. I only do this where I speak live. Most of these are hardcover books. They list about $30. If you, one will be $15. Two will be $14. If you get all six, it's going to go down to $10. It's less than a Big Mac at McDonald's now. It is written, thou shalt not steal, but this is a steal you should do to give people in your life. Okay? It's the only thing God will bless. Last, last thing, and then we're going to get moving, is it's, it's unique. Usually I bring it on the plane because it's not anywhere. It's not on Amazon. It's not anywhere. I only do it where I speak. And that is the Josiah Manifesto Uncensored. This is the DVD album. It has eight one-hour DVDs. I don't know if they have it up there, but it's eight one-hour where you actually see the prophetic things happening. It has all sorts of stuff that I could not put in the book. Other 
other mysteries and actually prophetic events and moments that changed the course of our nation. And something else is that, that there is something that happened that when I put the, the Josiah Manifesto out, 30 days later, something happened. And it was a mystery that's in the book that actually foretold it, and that is what happened in Israel. It foretold that there would be an invasion in Israel. It would happen on a Sabbath day. It would happen on a Hebrew holy day. It would lead to war, and it would take place on the first Saturday of October 2023. That is from a mystery that's there that I also, what I did is I did a, I never did this, I did a ninth disc, which I just, it's loose in there because I've never done that, which has that mystery on it. And you may be able to tell what is going to come to pass. So that's all there. It comes out to like $4 or something, a DVD. So that's all there and that's it. And if you want to get in touch or prophetic updates, they'll have a sheet and we'll send you free things and that's it. So let's get ready. Father, we just praise you, bless you. We thank you, Father, for this. I thank you for this gathering, Lord. I just thank, I thank you for Lou, and I thank you for everything you're doing here. It is special, unique, and powerful. And Father, I ask in my weakness, be strong in your power and speak. And I praise you and bless you. Have, impart your word in Yeshua, Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I want to bring prophetic pieces together, that we might know the hour we are in, where we are. The Bible says the sons of Issachar knew the times and what they should do. We need to know the times, that we might know what to do. Lou asked me if I could speak on the holy days, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, as it relates to what's coming, and also Jezebel, Jehu, the spirit, where we are prophetically. I'm going to do all of that. Now, and also, I'm going to also mention Esther because Esther is part of this event as well. And this will include some things in the Josiah Manifesto also from the Trinity of God and wherever, however God leads. The Bible, you know, the Bible says we need to know where we are prophetically. Let me begin with Jezebel. The days of Jezebel. We have to set the stage. Jezebel arose at a time when a nation that had known God had departed from God. They turned from God to the gods. Jezebel was part of it. We are in the days of a nation that has once known God, has turned from God, and to the spirits. And there are times that human vessels can embody the spirits. And though I will mention people, it's not about people, we got to pray for everybody. But I'm going to mention some things. Jezebel was a co-regent with her husband Ahab. Together they drove a culture war against the ways of God. Ahab was a divided man, compromised. He knew about God, but warred against him. He went back and forth, first king in Israel's history to champion the ways of Baal, which meant child sacrifice and sexual immorality and a war on the values of God. The term culture war exploded in America in the 1990s. And it was linked to the rise of a man to power who has already been mentioned tonight, Bill Clinton. Behind Bill Clinton is the template of Ahab. He was a man divided, knew about God, brought up in the Bible Belt, yet his policies overwhelmingly warred against that. Ahab was the first king to champion Baal worship, child sacrifice. Clinton was the first president to champion abortion. How long was Bill Clinton on the national stage? Bill Clinton, was, he was, when he, from his rise to power, governorship, 1979, to the end of his presidency, 22 years. In 1 Kings, it says, Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned in Samaria for a period of 22 years. Ahab wasn't alone, though. He had a wife. <laughs> See, you're too prophetic. I can't even go there. <laughs> Jezebel made it her goal to change the deep-seated re religious beliefs of Israel. Hillary Clinton actually pronounced these words. She said, De the deep-seated religious beliefs have to be changed. Jezebel was the champion of Baal worship, child sacrifice. Hillary Clinton would become Planned Parenthood's champion of abortion for the century. The days of the ancient king and queen were not only of apostasy, but of scandal. The scandal of Ahab and Jezebel was exposed in the 19th year of the king. 
What happens if we take the years of Bill Clinton from 1979 on 19 years? It brings us to 1998. That's the year of the big scandal. The paradigm actually in the Bible leads to January of 1998, exactly when it happened. Elijah rebukes Ahab over his sin, tells him that God is going to bring calamity on the nation. Ahab repents for a moment. God speaks as because of his repentance, I'm going to delay it, but it's going to come. It comes three years later. Three years after the king repents comes calamity. Did Bill Clinton ever repent of the scandal? Well, he said he did. He, East room of the White House, it was a prayer meeting. He said, I've sinned. Finally, he said, I've sinned against God and man. He asked for forgiveness. He was repenting. What happens if we take that date and add three years of Ahab? Will it lead to anything significant? We, if it, we take the three years, it leads to a date, September 11th, 2001. The day of the calamity. The repentance took place in the morning. 9-11 took place in the morning. The repentance took place, it began, the event began at 8.30. Three years later, 8.30 begins the whole thing. The rep president repented between 9 and 10. That's the peak of 9-11. The event ended at 10.30. The last event was the North Tower collapse at 10.29, and then it was over at 10.30. What happened next? Most people think Ahab's reign ended and soon, so, and that was at the end of Je Jezebel after that. It's not what happened. What happened in the Bible is the king's reign ended, but the queen went on on the national stage. So according to the paradigm, Bill Clinton's reign came to an end. Hillary Clinton went on on the Capitol stage. So what happened after that? We have to come to another mystery here of the spirit of the times, another embodiment. And this has to do with a man called Donald Trump. Donald Trump is following without knowing, and it's not about Trump, it's not about Clinton, but it's about God. Donald Trump is following the template of a man, the man called Jehu. Jehu was risen up at a time when the nation was falling away from God. God raised him up as a counterweight to the fall, unlikely person. Jehu was a man of controversy. Jehu was wild, unpredictable. You never knew what he was going to do or say next. <laughs> Jehu was not a politician. He was a fighter. Trump fights with everybody. In fact, I believe there's evidence in the ancient Hebrew that Jehu had a Twitter account, but we're not going there. We're not going there tonight. <laughs> not going to go there. We don't know if Jehu was a man of God, but we know he was used by God. Jehu made an alliance with the religious conservatives of the land. So did Donald Trump. Jehu took a partner in his chariot, who was a religious conservative, and went to the throne, his race to the throne. Donald Trump did the same thing. Jehu rose to power when the, for, when the king, at the time, had been in, on the national stage for 12 years. Trump rose to power when Obama had been on the national stage for 12 years. In order to come to power, Jehu had to come face to face in a showdown against the nation's former first lady, Jezebel. Trump had to come face to face in a showdown against the nation's former first lady. And so the poll said that Clinton would win, but the template in the Bible said, no, the one who walks in Jehu's footsteps will win. Now it's exactly what happened and the other one would fall. Well, on the very day of the Democratic convention, when Clinton would receive the nomination, a man gave a speech to lift her up and the theme of the speech, the word he kept saying again and again, he kept saying, they threw her down, they threw her down, they threw her down. If you take those words from the speech, they threw her down, Google it, it takes you to Second Kings with Jehu and Jezebel. Hillary Clinton had been on the national stage with her husband for 22 years, on her own for 12 years in public office, and then two years running for president. 22 years with her husband, 14 years after that, until her showdown. The ancient queen was on the national stage with Ahab for 22 years, on her own 14 years. Jehu arose to put to end the house of Ahab. Trump put to end, in a sense, the house of Clinton. But there was a spirit behind Jezebel, actually more than one, and ultimately we are dealing with spirits. It is a sp we war not against flesh and blood, we war against rulers. And the return of the gods, that's what I open up. And I speak of Messiah's parable that Lou alluded to. That he says a man was possessed by a spirit, then he was delivered, and having, then he became empty of God, and the spirit returns with seven other ones. And I share how it's not just about a man. He says, so it will be with this generation. 
And I share how any civilization, any nation, any culture that, had, that has been cleansed by God, delivered of paganism, as in Western civilization, even America, and turns away from God, empties itself of the gospel of the word of the spirit, the spirits that were cast out of it will come back into it. It is happening now. If you want to understand what's been happening in America for the last half century, it is this. It is a dangerous thing for any civilization that has known God, a Christian, to turn away from God. See, the, it's worse than paganism. God, the Lord said it'll be worse. The last state is worse than the first one. You see, a pagan civilization could produce a Nero, but a post-Christian one, an apot, will produce a Hitler or an Antichrist. We are witnessing, what we're witnessing is a repossession of the same gods have now come to America. And now I have three in particular, in the, in the Return of the Gods, I speak of the Dark Trinity. At least two of them are linked, and really all of them, to Jezebel. One of them was named Baal, meaning the possessor. We know him as Baal. The worship of Baal involved child sacrifice, the killing of children. And the capital city of ancient Israel was the temple of Baal, where children would have been sacrificed. The Bible says when Jehu began his rise to power, to the throne, the temple of Baal, he, he brought it down. He, he crushed it. So when Jehu rises, the temple of Baal falls. The rise of Trump to the president began when he announced his presidency in the summer of 2015. Turns out there has been a, an ancient temple of Baal that has stood in the world for almost 2,000 years in the Middle East. When Trump began his rise, says that when Jehu rises, it falls. Trump began his rise, two months later, the ancient temple fell to the ground. Now, near the end of the showdown between Trump and Clinton, this is a spiritual war, the issue of killing children came to the forefront, if you remember that last debate. Around the same time, an object appears in New York City. I went down there to witness it. We actually filmed it. You know what they did? They erected in New York City the arch of the Temple of Baal. The arch that led into that temple. They erected at City Hall. They had leaders of New York City having a ceremony around the arch of Baal. With music of Baal is a sign of warfare of two spirits. Baal on one hand. Jehu on the other. God ultimately. Jehu is the one who pulled down the temple of Baal. So if Trump walks in the footsteps of Jehu, and it's not about Trump, God is sovereign, then the temple would say that Trump would be used to pull down a temple of Baal. America has a temple of Baal. You know what it is? It's what allowed us to kill 60 million children. It's Roe versus Wade. So that's why so Trump was used for that there. And he would do it by appointing three Supreme Court justices. And if you remember, when he appointed the second one, Kavanaugh, all hell broke loose on Capitol Hill. It was ultimately spiritual. It was ultimately about that. It was ultimately the spirit of Baal. But you know what happened? When they were having that, that, that all the, that, that furious debate on the House over this war, an object appears in front of the Capitol building at that time. It was the Arch of Baal. Again, we are in a war between life and death. As it has been said here tonight, Revival is not just a nice thing. Revival is life or death. But there's more to the battle. And this relates to the gathering in Washington that is coming. There was another goddess linked to Jezebel. The Bible says that Jezebel was the daughter of a king of Sidon named Etbal. We have historical evidence of this king. It is recorded that this king, the previous king, was murdered by this king, Jezebel's father. Well, that tells you something about Jezebel. But very interesting. Because it says that, that the one who became king, who usurped the throne, Jezebel's father, actually was the priest of a goddess named Astart or Ashtora or Ishtar. Ishtar. So Jezebel was raised by the priest of Ishtar. Ishtar, one of the three spirits that have come back to America. She appears all over. In Sumer, she's called Inanna. In Greece, she's called Aphrodite. In Rome, Venus. In Babylon, Assyria, Ishtar. She was the goddess of unbridled sexuality, lust, immorality. She was a prostitute. She's the harlot, she was the harlot goddess. In ancient times, she sexualized pagan culture. 
So notice the Bible says first Baal, then Ashtora. When a nation first turns away from God, it opens the door for sexual immorality. First came Baal, then came Ashtora. Her mission is to turn a Judeo-Christian civilization into a pagan one by seducing it through the realm of sexuality. So what would we expect to happen? Exactly what happened. All of a sudden, in the 1960s, when we start turning away from God, all of a sudden, a sexual revolution. And soon after that, I mean, what happens is, you know, a prostitute takes sex out of marriage and puts it into the marketplace. So what we have watched is sex take, being taken out of the covenant of marriage and being put in our culture, and so she has sexualized our culture. And when that happens, a prostitute weakens marriage. So we've watched as marriage has been weakened, as divorce, as broken homes, broken children. All these things are linked together. And her workings have not stopped. It's no accident that when you have the sexual revolution, we have also had the destroying of marriage. In ancient times, she was called by the Greeks they called her the sacred prostitute, but the word for prostitute is the word porne, from which we get porn. No accident as she comes, pornography explodes in this nation. She's the inventor. The first pornography in the world is the writings about this, pro this goddess. And now there's so much more, but I'm just gonna say this here. It's no accident. At the same time of the 1960s with this revolution, same time, you have another revolution, another revival, and that is the revival of the occult. Ouija boards, astrology, fortune tellers, New Age, Eastern religions. Today, there are more witches in America than there are Presbyterians. But she was also the goddess of casting spells and the occult. It all goes together. But there was even more. When I looked at the ancient Mesopotamian inscriptions, I found something strange about her about the goddess, about this enchanter. She says, in her inscription, she says, I am a woman, I am a man. One of her hymns says, you turn, you turn a man into a woman, and a woman into a man. You wanna understand what's happening now? It all goes back to the spirits. This is her deeper work. She can't show it at the beginning, it was too radical for the 60s. But as she takes possession of a culture, this is the deeper work that starts manifesting. This is the spirit that blurs the line between man and woman, boy and girl, male and female, merges them together, confuses them together. One of the ancient inscriptions says, she grinds away the masculinity of men. She seeks to emasculate men. She rages against them, as did the goddess. This is what happened in her mythology. It says, it says she seeks to remove them from their calling, or take men away from manhood, away from being protectors, providers, husbands, and fathers, and seeks to feminize them. And so she seeks to separate the sexes. At the same time, it says the goddess turns women into men. So there's another spirit that has come on our culture to defeminize women. Speaking of what is coming in Washington. To take women away from womanhood. Women away from motherhood, marriage, away from men. The goddess defied male leadership and she defied, quote, the patriarchy of the gods. She, was, she had a rage against men, male authority. Well, we've seen this come in our culture. The goddess was female with male characteristics, a nature, male nature. So she seeks to make women into her image. By her, but her powers went deeper to transform. The goddess had a mysterious priesthood. They were men who filled her temples, who dressed up in the clothing of women. It is written, she dresses men as women, she dresses women as men. They were under her possession. So if you see this coming to your culture, you know someone's back. You see, they, they walked around in her temple and families, parents would bring their families' children to watch these men in drag dance and perform. But remember what Messiah said. When the spirits come back, they come back worse and stronger. In ancient times, she possessed a priesthood, but now she's seeking to possess an entire generation of children. The gods are always after the children. If you can get the children, you have the nation.
and you have the future. Began by, remember some of you, it began when, when we said, we'll take prayer out of school, not a big deal. We'll just take prayer from the children, not a big deal. It was a big deal. Because the, the law of what Messiah says about the possession is if you take God out of the house, out of the schools, something else is coming back into the schools. If you take God from the children, something else is coming into the children. But it goes further. It says the God is actually turns men into women, turns women into men. One of the things the goddess did among her priesthood was to have the men surgically transition. I found an ancient inscription. Describes the transition. They're dancing before, dancing in worship to the goddess, carrying scalpels to celebrate their transition. Now that adults are doing that to children, what on earth could possess an adult to do this to a child? Well, this could possess them. One ancient inscription reveals that the goddess was the goddess of parades. It says she made the people parade. What was the sign of the parades? Every year in the summer, the spirit of the goddess would cause men to parade through the city streets as women and women to parade as men. The bending of gender, parades of color, when you see these things. In the ancient world encounter, the goddess claimed one month as her own, where she actually possessed the culture, and her spirit especially did, a month of processions, rituals, licentiousness. What month was it? For that, I look back to the writings of St. Jerome, and he describes the whole thing. And he says in Latin, it was the month of Iunium, or in English, the month of June. She was the goddess of pride, so it became the month of pride. See, when you turn away from God, everything goes back. June used to be possessed by this, and so now June has been repossessed. The spirits return to their house. The goddess was linked to a sign. What sign? The sign of the rainbow. And that's the mystery of the rainbow. That's why the rainbow has been spreading over our culture, replacing the cross. That has become a sign of, alter, of altered sexuality. It's replacing it. And yet the rainbow does not belong to a goddess or a man or a movement. The rainbow belongs to our God. But even this is part of the mystery because in her mythology, she's the goddess who steals what belongs to other gods. And then here, those who lift up the rainbow are flaunting this in the face of God. They don't know what they're doing. Could the mystery even lie behind the Supreme Court? Well, there have, there have, there's a, the special time that the goddess claimed was June, particularly the end of June, around the time of the summer solstice. There were three Supreme Court decisions that altered sexuality and marriage. I'm not going to go into detail except to say this. They happened over a 12-year period, ended with the changing of marriage. Every one of them took place in the month of June. Every one of them took place in the last days of June, the days of the goddess. Every one of them happened on June 26th, the exact same day that's linked to the goddess. Do you remember the day when marriage was altered and the White House lit up, was lit up with a rainbow? It's almost like saying, hey, we're giving America over to this spirit. That night, on the ancient calendar of the Bible and Babylon, was the 10th day of Tammuz, the day that legalized a man to marry a man. But on the ancient biblical, or actually biblical and Babylonian encounter, in the writings of Babylon, it says that that day, the 10th of Tammuz, is ordained for the casting of a spell to cause a man to love a man. When the spirits come in to a cult, now there's another one too, we're not going to get into tonight, but when the spirits come in, they come into a, a Christian, Judeo-Christian civilization, they do it in the name of tolerance. Tolerance, anything goes, it's okay, anything goes. But once they get in, then tolerance is thrown out the window. Then they start demanding that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. They war against those who resist them, especially believers. It was believers who cast them out in the days of Rome, and so they have marked you. But we war not against flesh and blood. And we must war because we have something greater on our side. Speaking of that, and speaking of the event to come, and Esther. In the book of Esther, Haman sends forth a decree to bring death and destruction to God's people. The decree is linked to the 13th day of the 12th month. 13th day, 12th month, decree of evil and death and destruction. 
There was a decree that began when it was received by the Supreme Court. The day it was heard before the Supreme Court was December 13th, the 13th day of the 12th month. The Bible says that's of an evil decree. That was Roe versus Wade. But in the book of Esther, there's another decree. This one is sent by Mordechai and Esther. And this one goes forth and nullifies the first decree of death and destruction. It went forth, the Bible says, on the Hebrew date, 23rd day of Sivan, Sivan 23. Sivan 23 became a sacred day in the Hebrew calendar. That day, the Jewish people pray for the overturning of evil decrees. The case that would overturn Roe versus Wade was Dobbs versus Jackson. Went forth to the Supreme Court on June 15, 2020, but on the Bible's calendar, it went forth on Sivan 23, the day of the decree that will overturn the evil decree of death and destruction. So picture it. Jewish people are praying that day, God nullify the evil decree of death. And on that day, God is sending it to be nullified. We pray for power on this event. That power. Now there's a mystery of days I open up in the book um, in which the shakings that came upon us at the beginning of COVID, it was that shaking, the summer of rage, the, the, the lockdowns, the, the, all, the, the, the play, everything was determined by the sacred calendar of God. We're not, we don't have time to open up at all, but not only that, it would determine the calendar of God, the holy days would, de would determine what was gonna happen and exactly when it would happen. Let me give you a little taste of it. The first holy day, you know it, is Passover. Passover is the only holy day that is specifically linked to a plague or a contagion. So what happens? It's, not only is it linked to a, a plague, it's the only Hebrew holy day that's linked to a plague and a lockdown at the same time. God says, go in your house, stay in there until the plague. On the day when we were all the peak of the lockdown, that spring, we're all locked down, the, much of the world locked down, we're, and the plague is passing. Jewish people are in their houses because it's Passover. And they're recounting how they were, a plague was passing through the land and they were locked in their houses and a plague is passing through and they're locked in their houses. If you go to the next festival, it's called Shavuot, also known as Pentecost, the day of the holy fire of God. The fire of God's people, the, the fire of the spirit, the tongues of fire. On, as it approaches that next holy day, which is a Hebrew holy day, Pentecost, as they approach it, a fire comes on America. Not a good one. A fire comes, our cities go up in flames. As the Jewish people are lighting the, the fires of the candle on, to usher it in, that very night is the night the fire of the summer of rage exploded across America on the day of fire and the whole summer. And then there comes the feast of trumpets. That is the day that the, the shofar is blown and it says, get ready, get ready to meet God because judgment's coming and you gotta get right with God. It's the day that begins the 10 days of awe, 10 days of repentance to get right with God, which culminate on the day of Yom Kippur, the atonement. That's the day when judgment is sealed or redemption and change is sealed. Now in the Feast of Trumpets, the Jewish people, the eyes of the Jewish world, they turn to God as the judge of the universe. And they turn to God as the judge in the high court of heaven where he passes judgment and passes judgment also on who shall pass from the earth. In the year of shakings and COVID and the rage and on the day of trumpets, the day of the high court of heaven, the eyes of America turn to the high court of America because God touches the high court of America on the day of the high court of God. That is the day that Judge Ginsburg passed from the earth who was radically pro-abortion. That very event, see God is saying, Supreme Court itself was part of the sin. Supreme Court sinned. But the Feast of Trumpets begins the time of repenting for a nation to repent of its sin. And so God is saying, listen, you might have a Supreme Court, but I, I have a more Supreme Court. You might have judges, but I am the judge of all and I can overturn your verdict. And it was only that event that, that the, the removing of one seat that allowed for 
Roe versus Wade to be overturned and it happened on the Feast of Trumpets. That's when it began. Now trumpets leads to Yom Kippur, holiest day of the Bible, which is what this is all about. The day when man stands before God, a nation stands before God and it's gotta repent of its evil. That's when it's all sealed. Day of fasting, praying, confessing, repenting. The day when you enter in beyond, beyond the, the veil to stand in the presence of God, man and God. It was the day when the nation's sins could be forgiven. Prophetically, it speaks of the day of the Lord when man and God will stand face to face. You know, there's something was said, and it struck me as I was there, and we talked about it in the car, and that is that on the Day of Atonement, the first people who had to repent were the priests of God. If we want to see revival, we have to be the first ones. We have to use this time to get right. Yom Kippur is the day of the sacrifice, which speaks of Messiah. Now in the mystery, I didn't open it up, but all the shakings of that year Follow the sacred calendar. Each one matched the Hebrew holy day. But it stopped just before Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was the next event that year. And I always wondered why you did every single one, but stopped before Yom Kippur. Well, now there's going to be a gathering back in, the, in Washington, D.C. on Yom Kippur. Let's pray that this is the one God will use. Lou and I met this past Yom Kippur exactly one year before to speak and pray for that day. Now, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you regarding this is that what's coming, regarding the power of God. Can we change history? In the year of shakings, and we're all locked down and all the stuff going on, Hebrew holy days, I was led with another man of God named Kevin Jessup to call for a national day of prayer and repentance. It was called The Return. And it's interesting, when I look back, I met with Kevin the first time exactly one year before that in the same place where Lou and I met. And we didn't plan it. And we planned, we planned the day of the return, year, like two years before, because we had a sense that there was going to be shaking that year. And it was only when it came to pass just one week before is when God overturned the Supreme Court, made the change. So we gather, some of you were there, we gather on the National Mall, as you're, we're gonna do now, tens of thousands of believers from all over the nation to repent and pray and intercede for America in the middle of all the shakings. Millions took place in their houses and churches. We had no idea, but it turned out that the day that was chosen, which was also a Saturday, the day that we chose without knowing what, no, at all, fell on the appointed sacred calendar of Israel. It was called Shabbat Shuvah, which basically means the day of the return. So we had the day of the return on the day of the return. We had no idea what we were doing. You see, in God, you don't have to know what you're doing. You just have to know the one who's doing it. That was actually the last holy day. That was before Yom Kippur, which was not fulfilled. And that was leading to repentance, turning of a nation. That's what it's appointed for. But because of what happened on the Feast of Trumpets, Trump had to appoint one more justice. It was the last one, and that was the key one. Because that was the one vote that overturned Roe versus Wade. So this is the very act. And you know what day he chose? He chose the day of the return the day of Shuvah, of repentance. And I'm sure I would think that President Trump was not studying the original Hebrew behind the text. <laughs> I think he probably just woke up one day and said, it's a good day, why don't I do it? <laughs> but he chose that day that God appointed for the turning of the nation's course. And so we are there, you know, we are there on the National Mall, I was led that day to, take a, to talk about Jeremiah when he looked at the Valley of Hinnom and where the, where the Israelites were killing their children and we had a strong emphasis on, on the killing of children what, to overturn that. And I was led to take a clay jar and smash it that day. But I was led and we're praying, if my people, who are called by my name, as Cindy said, if my people will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. At the end of the prayers... I was led, I was led for some time before that, that I, we had to seal it all with the sound of God's power. What's the sound of God's power? That's shofar. 
I said it for 5 p.m. I just felt led it's gonna be 5 p.m. And we gotta seal it with this blowing of the shofars. The president not only decided to set in motion the overturning of Roe versus Wade on that day when it happened, but he set it to happen at 5 p.m. Now we were running late, so we didn't do it at 5 p.m. But the president was also running late. <laughs> God can use, can anoint running late. I called up the men who had shofars and prayer shawls to the platform on the National Mall. And I told everybody, when you hear the sound of the trumpets, everybody shout as on the day of Jericho. And the walls will come tumbling down. And so I said, now we seal the prayers we prayed here. And I believe we were sealing 50 years of prayers. I said, now in the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, let the power of God go forth. And I said the word go. At that moment, the trumpet sounded. The people shouted. Meanwhile, on the lawn of the White House stood the president. At his side was Amy Coney Barrett. He opens his mouth and sets in motion the overturning of Roe versus Wade, the one vote. I said, go. The trumpet sounded. The people shouted. It was five o'clock, four minutes, and 33 seconds. The overturning of Roe versus Wade began when the president opened his mouth. It was five o'clock, four minutes, and 33 seconds. The exact same moment. The same year, the same day, the same hour, the same minute, the same second. This is the secret history of God, of history. Roe versus Wade was overturned by the power of God, by the prayers of God's people, and the sound of God's power, and the sound of Jericho when the walls come tumbling down. That's the secret of history. And you can do it, this can happen. You could, this, I'm giving you, I wanna give you encouragement about what's coming. Uh, and it happened on the day of repentance, of turning, in the year of the ju of jubilee, of abortion, when the trumpet sound. Now, I'm actually going to do something I don't, haven't normally done. I want to show you that prophetic moment that altered literally the history of America. Set in motion at that moment. This was the one vote. I want you to, you're going to see both events. You're going to see what's happening on the mall, like we're, you're going to be doing in, in October, and you're going to see Trump at the White House. So if you can roll it, let's. From here, Lord, we, as we seal the return and the power of God. Now, Lord, let the sound of your power go forth to the world. In yet Jesus, Yeshua's name, go. I stand before you today to fulfill one of my highest and most important duties under the United States Constitution the nomination of a Supreme Court Justice. That's him. That's it. That's the power of God. That's the God of Moses, the God of Elijah, the God of Jeremiah, the God of the apostles. He's alive and well. He's on the throne. He has no intention of getting off of it. That's the Almighty. That's the God of Israel. That's the God of all nations. That is our God. That is your God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our God is amazing. Now you know something, you know that it started, now just to tell you this, we could never have put that together. Because again, I told you, we don't know what we're doing, but he does. The return started at nine in the morning. This is, this is, this is eight hours later, and we had about, a, they, they, they scheduled about 150 people to pray and speak, and you know, if you didn't know this, for a preacher to finish on time, that's a miracle of God. We had 150, if any one of them went one second too long or one second too short, it never would have happened. You see, when God says, when it says that God, it says he works all things together, it means all things. All that's some all things, every moment of your life, it's happening. You may not see it, but it's happening. Sometimes you, he lifts the veil, but it's happening every moment. You follow God, he takes care of the rest. Now I said, God, 
I said, that was mind blowing. When I saw this, on the, when we did all that, oh my, I said, God, you're amazing. He knows he's amazing, but we always sometimes have to learn. You're amazing. I said, but God, you could have done one thing a little bit better. It's always good to correct God. I said, it was the moment of Jericho. There were six trumpets. It would have been nicer to have seven. And then it hit me. It's like I heard, there was a seventh trumpet. What's your president's name? Trump the trumpet. He was the seventh trumpet. The president of the United States was the seventh trumpet. And the trump sounded. And when the trump sounds, the miracle happens. Jubilee, God's people have victory. When the trump sounds, the walls come down. When the trump sounds. I love God. And he has a sense of humor too. Now, I'm just going to throw this in. You know, do you know when Trump was born, and this is not about Trump, but you know when he was born? It was a Friday. The Jewish people have, every Sabbath, they have, Friday night, they have a sacred appointed scripture to be read on that day. You know what it was? Appointed? It was about the making of the trump, the trumpet. That when he was born, it was about forming the trumpet. Now, there are so many more mysteries, but let me just say something. You know, Lou and, and I, I said, shared that on the day I finished the other book, that is when this happened. That's when Roe vs. Wade was broken. And you know, Roe vs. Wade is an, was an altar on which we killed 60 million children. The most colossal altar. But you know, I never shared that. I wasn't going to share this, but Lou said, keep going. So, <laughs> so when I was working on the return of the gods, I didn't tell anybody. But one of my associate pastors named Michael wakes up in the middle of the night and he says, I gotta tell you something. I said, what? He never does this. He said, I was woken up in the middle of the night and I saw a vision and I saw, I don't know what's going on, but I saw you and you were in front of all these altars of these gods. And God said, prophesy to the altars and you brought forth the word to the altars and the altar cracks in two, they crack in two. Well now, I, the day that I finished that word, the altar cracked in two. The hand of God, that's the hand of God. But here's the thing, you know, the breaking of Rover, we know it's not the end, we know it's just the beginning of the fight, but it's a sign. Because, because, in the Bible, the sign of the broken altar was a gigantic sign. Back then, you know, it was a sign, it's a sign that's linked more than anybody, more than anybody else, it's linked to the man called Josiah. Josiah's birth was foretold with a broken altar. Josiah rose up and he broke the altars of the gods. He, you know, he broke the altars of Baal and Ashtorah, Ishtar and Molech. You see, back then, you see, you see a few things. One, Josiah was risen up at a time when the nation was about to be judged. And yet, and yet God raises him up instead to have revival. And so we are, the sign of the, joke, the broken altar, back then, revival wasn't, it wasn't about a tent meeting. That's great. But the sign of the broken altar, that was the sign of revival. Because when they repented, they went to the altars, and they broke those altars. And so this is, we are at the Josiah moment, where a nation stands between judgment or revival. Judgment or revival. Sometimes there can be both, but the thing is, without revival, there is no hope for America. And the only hope is revival. And the only hope is the breaking of that altar. And there are keys, and I'm not going to go through them, we don't have, but that's why about 100 pages of the book is that manifesto. The, what are the keys of Josiah? How did he do it? What did he know? If we're in the Josiah moment, what did he know? What did he do? And the thing is, it's, it's there. Because Josiah shouldn't have been what he was except the power of God. Because his father was a disaster. His grandfather was a bigger disaster. And yet, his, his culture was a disaster, about to be judged, and somehow, God, somehow he raised up and he loves God with all his heart. And he serves God, and he repents, and he, he loves God. And he did not allow the darkness to corrupt him. He did not allow the darkness of his culture to turn him. Instead, he changed the culture by the power of God. That's for you. He did that. How did he do that? Well, you know, first of all, he separated himself from the darkness. 
Because you cannot, this is again, I believe it's the spirit. Lou said it, you know, but you cannot be, you cannot make a difference if you're not different. You cannot change something if you're not changed. So the thing is that he separated. We have to separate from that dark, whatever it is, we gotta separate. And then he plugged himself all the more into God's presence. That's the only way he could have done it. He broke down the altars of his culture. The altar of killing babies, the altar of sexual immorality, the altar of gender confusion, which was back then. The altar of, he broke it down. But not only that, we're supposed to change the world, but you know what, not only that, also, he also broke the altars in his own life. Because the Bible says there were altars in the palace and in the temple. So the thing is, if you wanna, if we wanna make a difference in this world, we, if there's any altar in your life, you gotta break it. You want revival? You gotta break it. Break the altar, break the altar, and we'll come. Break the altar. You know, Gideon was a great hero of God, but he couldn't be a great hero until, because he, he, he had an altar in his backyard to Baal. He had to break that altar, then he could become a great hero. So you, so you, so you. You know, a lot of believers are living like, oh, man, you know, it's, uh, what's next? They're on the defense. They're not, unfortunately, the world is affecting much of the church more than much of the church is affecting the world. They're on the defensive, but you know what? Josiah did not live on the defensive. He lived on the offensive. We're supposed to live on the offense, not the defense. We're the light and we're the salt. What are we doing? We got to live on the offense. He did not live in this world to survive because then the devil could have used it. Hey, I'll take this. I'll, I'll, I'll cancel you, Josiah. I'll take away this. I'll take away that. He lived on the, in the world not to survive. He lived on mission. He was a missionary. He was a, an agent of heaven on earth. We have to become agents of heaven on earth. We're on earth with a mission. You know, some of these growing up, you saw the Blues Brothers, they said, we're, we're on a mission from God. They were not, but you actually, you actually are on a mission from God. You know what he did also? He got the whole nation to come together for Passover. What's Passover about? The Lamb of God, the blood of the Lamb. We cannot have revival without the blood of the Lamb. We cannot have revival without the power of the blood, and that is on the heart here right now. Without the gospel, we cannot have it. And without repentance, we cannot have it. After 9-11, everybody rushed to church, but you know what, there was no revival, you know why? Because there was no repentance. Repentance brings revival, it starts with us. You know, Josiah's busy doing God's work, and, and, and he's breaking the altars. And one day, he goes to Bethel, where they have all these altars, and he breaks them down, and he sees this one stone, and he says, what's that? And they said, the men say, that's the, that's the marker of the prophet who came here centuries ago and prophesied that you would be born, and you would come here this day and do what you did. Can you imagine, Josiah? Whoa, whoa, that's destiny. You see, Josiah was born for his age. And the age was made for him. It needed him. But you know what? It's not just Josiah. You were born for this age. Right now, you were appointed. There is a destiny. You were appointed for the age, and the age is appointed for you. It needs you. Some, some believers say, oh, I'm scared of the end times. Don't be scared of the end times. If God didn't want you in the end times, he would have put you in the Middle Ages and you would have complained about that. <laughs> God put you in the, in the end times because if he puts you here, then he has appointed you for this day. If he's appointed you, he will anoint you. And if he will anoint you, he will empower you and he will be with you for victory. <laughs> we have to pray that the hand of God will move so mightily on this gathering to touch the course of history on his sacred high holy day. These are the most exciting of times. You know, and some believers also, when you're, you know, many of you prayed, I wish, Lord, oh, I, I would so love, I wish I could live in, in Bible times. Congratulations, welcome to Bible times. These are Bible times and you're here. You see, if the dark is getting darker, that it's the, the lights have to get brighter. It's not time to say the light saying, oh, I can't shine because it's dark. You shine more because it's dark. If these are the days of Baal and Ashtorah, Ishtar and Molech, then these must surely be the days of Elijah. If the gods have returned, it's time for the Elijahs of God to return. It's time for you and me to be the Elijahs of the day. 
It's not time to fear or compromise or cower. It's time to take your stand in boldness and courage. Time to stand on the mountain as Elijah did and say, listen, if Baal is God, you know, you serve him and go to hell. But if the Lord is God, serve him. That's what we need to do. It is time to stand against the gods and idols of our age and for the one and only true living God. And it is time also, my brothers and sisters, to take your stand against that spirit, against that sin, against that, that, that God that has tried to intimidate you, harass you, hinder you, defile you, tempt you, discourage you, compromise you, make you mess up and, and, and keep you down and make you bow to it. It is time to take your stand, all of us, if we want to see revival, take your stand against that darkness, take your stand against that habit, that sin, that fear, that gloom, that darkness, and say, no more. I will not bow down to the gods. I will not bow down to Baal. I will not bow down to Ishtar. I will not bow down to Molech. I will not bow down my knee to you again. I will not bow down to that sin, your bondage, your temptation, your gloom. I will only bow down my knee to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the name of Yeshua, you have no authority. In the name of Messiah, I say, get out of my land. Get out of my nation. Get out of my house. Get out of my life. Get your hell out of my life. For greater is he in me than you. Greater is the God of my salvation. For the Lord says, arise and shine. For your light is come. In the name above all names, the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord of all, the King of all kings, and the God above all gods. Amen. We just saw a panoramic view of where America is right now. And we don't dare miss this moment. I want to say, when I met with Jonathan, I was so amazed with his story of the sovereignty of God that all these dates and things were set. I don't know if Jonathan's left. We, I want to thank you. Can, thank you for being courageous enough to even say the things that you've said. What you don't know, Jonathan, is that we were carrying in the late 90s a movement called the Elijah Revolution and everything that you're saying, we've been engaging in intercession all the way along. I felt like we have met someone a rabbi in the spirit with divine understanding is the time signs of the times. But you've got to understand, not just John, all of us need to understand that behind that sovereign movement, a man named Matt Lockett dreams of the vice president's wife, Pence, concerned about the Supreme Court. And in the dream, Matt walks up to her and says, and says, remember the name Amy Coney Barrett. They begin to pray for her because of a revelation, intercession with God's sovereignty. We, we could tell you story after story. And if that's the case and this thing ended, why not believe, as we'll talk on Saturday, for 100,000 LGBT to be saved with Ishtar being broken? And with a storyline of Esther for the Day of Atonement, why shouldn't we believe for a massive communion revival? I, 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 I don't want you to miss this. We can't just say, well, this is so cool. He's calling us into eight months of engagement, yeah. hearing God's voice. And tomorrow, we're going to share a dream that is gonna be painful, but glorious, and shows us the journey of the Red River going to 
a place called the Pool of Siloam. It's the blood river leading us to the Lincoln Memorial and the pool that I believe. But to get there, there's devastating issues and the judgment on the priesthood. And folks, we'll go there tomorrow and we all gotta come together to really humble ourselves. Yeah. We'll tell this story and I, I don't go into it. I simply wanna say, history belongs to the intercessor and God is the Lord of history. Jonathan, thank you. Give him a hand. Let's give, give a hand to Jonathan for this message. I, I want you to get his books. I think he's gonna be signing these books. You may not like what he said today, but we were praying all those very things for years underneath it all. Can we just give God the glory? And it's a sign of hope. She dreams of Josiah on 222, and he brings up the Josiah mandate. Maybe we're in a day, in the midst of judgment, a window of mercy could come. Todd, why don't you uh, make a final announcement? Did you have anything you want to say? Cindy? I want, let's hold on. I don't want to miss a moment. It's still, it's not even nine. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we listened to a prophet set in order that knew the signs of the times. And Lord, we had to do this in Colorado Springs. Yes. I was thinking, Lou, when we lived in Colorado Springs, and I remember when we left, someone said, I drove a false prophet out of my city today. Oh, yeah. And I thought, and it was so painful. And because I knew this, this city was called to be the Air Force. This city was had a prophet's call. This city is called of God in a massive way. And you know, there's sometimes when God starts bringing all these pieces falling together. Yeah. And the Lord said, remember the name of your building here in Colorado Springs? It was the Josiah Center. And the Lord said, you remember what street the Josiah Center was on? It was on the Garden of the Gods. Wow. And I want to say something. The prophetic mantle is coming back on Colorado Springs. And God is going to release the spirit of Elijah that's going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And the Lord said, tonight I'm doing a new thing. And I want to say, let it begin now, God. Let it begin tonight. And we thank you for the spirit of Elijah. And we decree it is established here now at this moment. And then I saw Satan trying to rob Colorado again when they threw Trump off the ballot. And the Lord said to me, I want you to go to Washington, D.C. and go right into the Supreme Court. So Mike and I went, about froze to death. Waited three hours. It was so cold. We were all bundled up, you know, because they only give limited tickets. And we went into the Supreme Court. And there we heard the most incredible testimonies. The, you know, just that, that, that side that's trying to come against what Trump needs to do for this nation. I'm unapologetically going to say I believe he's the wartime president we need. 
You know, prophets, we we don't care about politics. Anyway, and and so I sat there and heard the arguments. And then when there was a constitutional call, I thought and I watched in amazement. I remember when this man in his Justice House of Prayer, Matt Lockett, I prophesied to him, God is going to raise up a champion for the courts. And then you found out that Neil Gorsuch's name means champion. And going back in the purposes of God, we got invited to go to the White House on the day that they swore in Neil Gorsuch after he prayed that the champion would arise. I went up to him in the, uh, 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 pardon? It, no, no, it was in, it was in the uh, uh, East Room there of the White House. And I said, do you know what your name means? He goes, I have no idea. I said, it means champion. You have been prayed into this place. What are the odds that I would be in the White House? You told him when Ruth Ginsburg. No, when, when you come, come, get up. Yeah, get in here, Matt. <laughs> We're, we're not, listen, listen, we're not just telling stories. Yeah, we're not just telling stories. We're actually laying down an understanding that this is how it works. Divine intelligence, praying what you're hearing and seeing the fruit of Isaiah 22, 22. I'll remove Shebna and I'll put in his place Eliakim. This is that what we're talking about. So go ahead. Oh, 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 and this is very important. I'm going to go back to Supreme Court in a minute. But it, Lou was speaking here in Colorado Springs. He didn't live here. And I went to see you. Remember, I said, go to the Supreme Court, Lou. No, you, you said this. <laughs> no, it, 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 Cindy's my spiritual mom, but she's a scary lady. And she said, if you don't take those kids that you mobilized in D.C., if you don't take this, God will remove you and put someone else in your place. And I said, God, I said to Cindy, I said to you, I said, I got to hear that from God. And I did. And we went to that to 18 years standing in front of the Supreme Court. That word launched me in, from Colorado Springs. Yeah, this is a birthplace. You got to get this. You got to get what's happening. Actually, one thing I also said, he said, do you know how many children I have? They might arrest me if I go. I go, and he said, I might go to jail. I said, well, I'll go with you. <laughs> okay, next piece. Go. So February 13th, 2016, I flew to Dallas. I was going to speak at Cindy's church, Trinity down in Dallas. And I get off the airplane, and the news is on the TV saying that uh, Antonin Scalia had passed away in, in Texas. And so spoke at the church on Valentine's Day. And then afterwards, uh, I went out with some of the leaders and we were having lunch and I get a phone call from her. <sighs> so uh, any Sometimes people don't want to answer my calls. <laughs> <laughs> so I answered the phone. She's like, where are you? <laughs> so I told her where we were. She said, stay there. I'm coming to you. <laughs> she left her mother's bedside who was who was in the hospital on her deathbed right yeah and and came to the restaurant and she prophesied over me and she she said uh uh you said you said uh god says that i have prepared a champion and i'm now ready to bring him up to the seat now hold the seat open for me and hold the seat open for my champion and then you left <laughs> And I went back to D.C. and uh, 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 President Obama uh, nominated Merrick Garland for that seat. And then the, the Senate Majority Leader would not schedule uh, a hearing uh, to, for that nomination. And that caused a great controversy in the nation. And everybody's wondering what's going on. And we've got a group in the prayer room. We knew exactly what was going on. Hold we, the line. You know. 
So here's what oh, we that did. Seat. We had the pictures of the, the nine Supreme Court judges on a board on the wall in the prayer room. And Scalia's picture had come down, so there was a vacancy. And we slipped a card in the vacancy that said reserved. And we, and, for, and we began to pray and prophesy. No one sits in this seat except the champion. Come on. And I don't know if you guys remember it, but there was a 99% certainty that Hillary Clinton was going to win that election that year. So what was the point? What was the point of holding the seat for her? But we had a prophetic word. Listen, you got to remember your prophecies, what Paul said to Timothy. Remember the prophecies spoken over you so that you may wage a good warfare with them. We stood in the prayer room for 50 weeks from the moment that, that Scalia passed away to the day, at, so Trump wins the election, to the day that he nominates Neil Gorsuch, 50 weeks to the day. So almost an entire year, we held the seat open and then found out that... How did you hold that seat open? Just standing in the prayer room, holding the line and praying and prophesying. But, but uh, we, it was... It, so, you know, when, when Trump campaigned, he said... You know, if I'm president, I would consider these 25 judges for the court. And then he narrowed it down after he was elected. He said, I'm thinking about these eight. He's such a showman. I'm thinking about these eight. And then he got it down to five. He's doing that with VP right now. And then he got it down to three. And we were in the prayer room that day. And, and there was a Native American guy on our team at the time. He says, well, I'm going to look at the meaning of the names. So he looks up the three remaining ones. And he looks up the first one. It didn't didn't really connect. The second one didn't connect. Then he looks up the name Neil Gorsuch. And that's when we saw the name Neil means champion. So we didn't realize it, but we had been praying for Neil for a year. We had been declaring without realizing, we've been declaring nobody sits in the seat except Neil. Okay, so we're in, <laughs> we're in the courtroom. <laughs> this is just like week before last. And we're in the courtroom, and, you know, Mike is there. If you saw the, what I posted, you know, he's wrapped up, you know, like a mummy. We're so cold. Anyway, and we're in our 70s. Anyway, we went, in, we went into the courtroom, and we're just praying and praying and praying. And so when it, when it time came, you know, they were, the judges started coming at, sorry, Colorado, but it's not you, Colorado, it was the other Colorado. Anyway, uh, uh, started, they started after and the uh, questioning of the Colorado case saying that they could keep Trump off the ballot. And who stands up? Neil Gorsuch. He shredded that case shredded it and then Kavanaugh that we were there praying all you know standing and crying out in DC also Kavanaugh gets in and gives him the one-two punch and then Alito comes up in his brilliant self and just you know puts the icing on the cake or the nail in the golf or whatever you want to say I mean and, and I want to say, what are the odds that I would randomly get a call to go for the swearing in of Gorsuch? God sent a prophet to tell the guy his name, that he was called to be a champion. You understand all these threads? But it began in Colorado Springs. You understand this Supreme Court thing with a prophet giving a word to someone who obeyed it, passed the baton to his son. His son picked up the baton and did what he was supposed to do, leading to the holding of the line. And I want to tell you what God did for me because I left my mother who was sick on that day. My mother actually passed away because I, uh, on a day that I asked God for, I said, God, when you take my mama home, I want it to be a specific day. Oh, I want to go back just a minute to say that when Dutch first preached his 222 message, we were here in Colorado Springs, and there was a young man in the audience that night named Will Ford, and I said, where are the Williams here? And Will Ford stood up, and that was the night in Colorado Springs that he joined with Dutch for the kettle tour, and Will started to tell the story, and then Will met Matt, and Matt, and they found out they're related. They they were, oh, well, are related. I mean, they found out that Matt's family owned Will's family. It's Colorado, folks. You listen to me. God has a plan. 
God has a plan. Now, let me tell you what God did for me, and then I'm going to give this up because I think Jonathan is back there waiting. But the plan, I said, God, I left my mom aside, and I went and gave her a prophetic word. Now, you take my mama home at a prophetic moment. On 222, right before 222, 221, I got a call. They have moved your mother from her hospital room. I said, where'd they move her? Room 222. I said, oh, God. My mother went to heaven on 222 in room 222 at 222 a.m. in the morning today. Amen. God bless you. I just have to say one thing. This is why the devil doesn't want Christians involved in politics. Come on. What a night. What a night. Something I noticed tonight is that some people read history, some write history, but intercessors change history. Come on. Did you see that? Amazing. Just a couple of things, and then we're going to dismiss you for tonight. Tomorrow morning, uh, things begin at 9 o'clock. The doors will be open at 8. The coffee shop's open at that time. I, this is very important, what I'm about to say. Uh, we uh, have parking across the street in addition to here. And tonight, uh, there were people parking in areas they shouldn't park in, and they could actually get towed if they're there tomorrow. So please do not park in front of fire hydrants, okay? <laughs> no fire hydrants. And where there's cones, there's a reason not to park there. So please do not park in those places. Those who can, if, if there's issues, there's handicap parking. But otherwise, you can park across the street if this parking lot fills up at the Maislin Moore Shopping Center across the street. Thank you so much. Anything else, Lou? God bless you. Avail yourself to Jonathan Kahn's book table, and you are dismissed. Thanks,